Some startups go up, others go down. Welcome to GeekWire's Elevator Pitch, where three entrepreneurs pitch their businesses in the 48 seconds it takes to get to the top of Seattle's first skyscraper, the Smith Tower. Over the course of nine episodes, we'll narrow the field from 27 entrepreneurs to one winner. In this episode of Elevator Pitch, presented by Smartsheet, we'll hear from three startup founders as they pitch their emerging businesses to our panel of leading investors and entrepreneurs. Steven Brandstetter, an angel investor and vice president at Smartsheet, he caught the entrepreneurial bug in college and sold his first startup to Active Network. Heather Redman, power broker and former Getty Images executive, who cut deals as the managing director of venture capital firm Flying Fish Partners. Richard Tate, the motorcycle riding Scotsman and mastermind behind the hit board game Cranium, who now stirs up new ideas inside Starbucks. The clock is ticking. Jump on board and ride with us on the elevator pitch and find out which entrepreneur has what it takes to make it to the top. My name is Alexa Anthony and I'm the CEO of Magic AI. Welcome to Smith Tower. At Magic AI, we use commodity cameras, computer vision software, and advancements in machine learning to monitor the health and performance of animals. Think of it like a fitness tracker without the wearable device. We could do everything from tracking the wellness and happiness of your pets at home to optimizing feed and water usage in cattle farming, but we have chosen the premium horse industry as our first vertical. Sport and racing horses can be worth millions of dollars individually, not to mention the emotional bond between horse and owner and existing solutions are labor intensive. We estimate a $1.2 billion addressable market for U.S. equine. Before a back injury, I trained and competed at the highest level of the equestrian sport. I've developed a team of seasoned technologists. We are now launching our MVP after beta testing in 10 locations around the U.S. We are looking to raise our seed investment round soon. Talk me through how you ch pricing and how you charge. Like how so we charge $100 a month per user or per customer, and our customers own a group of horses. Um, when they travel to competitions, they take their horses with them. So we're also installed at these competition facilities, um, and we charge a daily rate there. So the goal is they can go to the competition facility, pay 15 to 30 bucks a day, and demo the product, hopefully want to get it at their home facility. Were um, you so able to charge for MVP? So we have 10 paying beta customers, um, and our first pilot competition facility deployed this summer. Talk about uh, what is your sort of defensible moat on the technology or on the customer acquisition strategy, or what's, what's your defensible moat here? So we have three provisional patents filed, and we have one uh, published application in equine lameness detection. Um, we also have a competitive advantage. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about our competitors. So right now in the ag tech or the livestock industry, people are using a lot of wearable devices. So the pedometer, the collar on the cows, um, and this can be really challenging. I grew up on a farm. I know that it's not reasonable to have animals wearing devices all the time. You have to teach the staff how to use it and clean it and charge it and they break. Um, so this solution is not very scalable. Um, so we're using computer vision machine learning to solve the same problem with, with commodity video cameras. Um, you see companies like Caintus, uh, a company in Ireland that's doing computer vision machine learning um, to monitor cows. Um, and Alibaba just invested in a swine company doing the same thing in China. Um, so I think we have uh, an advantage that we're starting an equine because it's such a high value asset. Uh, they're concentrated. People are willing to spend a lot of money to be prestigious. Um, they're willing to spend more money on their horses than I think farmers are willing to spend on their cows. It's a lot about margins for farmers. One of my daughters is uh, equine crazy, so I can imagine uh, she's taking her horse to college with her. So, oh, great. <laughs> um, I, but I'm wondering what would she, what would be the data, what would be the insights that would be provided? Just walk me through the experience. My background, also, I went to University of South Carolina, competed on the equestrian team there. Um, and the whole reason why I started the company, I had a horse named Magic, so Magic AI. Um, and I lost Magic to colic. So it was an illness that he got in the middle of the night, and I didn't know what was happening. So I started the company. Um, using computer vision machine learning, we notify people when there are these emergencies going on so that your horse doesn't die in the middle of the night. Um, so we do these emergency alerts. So maybe my horse hasn't had water in 12 hours. Maybe there's somebody in the horse's stall at two in the morning that shouldn't be there. But we also do every time your horse eats, drinks, sleeps, moves. Um, we do an overall wellness um, metric. And so each horse has their own profile. So she'll log into the app, she'll get these um, video replays of when the horse is having an emergency or somebody's in the stall. She can also track the overall health wellness. So It's a baby monitor for a horse. 
Um, a little bit. Um, it is. It is very much and like. How that. do you how do you uh, track when the horse is not in the stall? Most riders have their phone in their pocket when they're riding, so we are using the. Um, back-end APIs for some existing apps where we can track how far the horses are going and how many jumps they've done. Um, but for the most part, we use all of our data collection with the video cameras. So it's all stall-based? It is all stall-based, okay. yeah. Another great example of an entrepreneur with a passion and a clear focus on who the target market mm -hmm. is. And I believe her, you know, my daughter would love to have constant interaction and monitoring of her horse. My questions around the stall is for the time that the animal spends grazing or outside the stall, if we use the baby monitor example, you want to have constant knowledge of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to have, get inf information around the whole horse's life. Yeah. And so if it's out grazing, uh, you know, that's where a wearable may have a competitive advantage because the animal has it with them uh, the whole time. I think both make sense to some degree, and it depends on the application. I mean, one of my concerns about the business overall from a venture standpoint is does the technology and the price point that you're using on the equine side, how do you take that into hog farming or cattle who are on an open range, you know, where wearable, really, what are you going to do, have a drone, you know, hovering over them for computer vision? There are a lot of um, just sort of issues about how does the business extend? and how do you really address each market at, on its own merits. They've chosen computer vision because it makes a ton of sense in a stall. And then the other question is, how much of the business is based on data acquisition versus deep analytics and yeah. AI of predicting yeah. that this particular kind of movement means that your horse is at risk of being lame if you take them on a jump course that has these characteristics or something you know I mean yeah. I like a, that they've already started to do some of that integration mm -hmm. so you've got the rider with their data you've got the camera collecting yeah. its data and I think you're right they need to take it to that next step mm -hmm. and get the wearable but I like that to your point they start they're starting out very focused they know their market they've got a passion I actually wouldn't it. go for breadth in this case I think yeah. the equine market might be big enough and I'd actually the pricing I think she should go north with the pricing. yeah yeah and that I, seems I, I, cheap relative to what people spend on their right, on their right. I mean well, you yeah. know it's insurance yeah. you're right. buying insurance right yeah yeah and once so you I, own a horse for everything else is like trivia yeah. right and you know Remy it's her lifestyle so you know I, I think with with that equine market there may be the opportunity to just go deep uh, yeah. because I like your insights into uh, you know it's 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 not just monitoring but it's the predictive analysis of what else right. could I change to right. help the performance of right. the horse improve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it's sort of like, hey, I tweaked the diet. Now what's exactly. happening in terms right. of all the other outputs? I mean, it's, you're, you're really a high-performance athlete, right? Yeah, and exactly. And so now, what are you going to do with yep. it? My name is Slava Gafonov, and I'm CEO of Enersoft Inc. Welcome to Smith Dowling. As uh, renewable energy transition is uh, happening right now, car manufacturers and utility services have a lot of data that they can analyze, but it's a very tedious process and usually people build tools like in MATLAB and uh, in Excel and they waste a lot of time. So our cloud analytics platform, similar to Tableau, is helping them to extract insights from the data. It analyzes petabytes of this performance data from different batteries, different chemistries, and helps them to make better decisions to cut costs and to produce uh, more reliable energy storage. Our our company has machine learning and artificial intelligence in it, so we can help these people to produce better energy storage. So you provide data analytics around battery usage? Yes, we provide battery analytics, battery analytics, energy storage analytics, any, any energy storage. It can be capacitors, ultra capacitors, flow batteries. And the main goal is to extract humans from the loop with artificial intelligence. So the agent actually help people to predict capacity, predict your battery lifetime. Uh, think about batteries in your everyday life. You uh, start in the morning, you have alarm clock probably with battery. Your watch has battery. Your phone, your car probably if you have Tesla or any hybrid. Everything is connected to batteries and this industry is growing quite a bit. Right now it's $20 billion and it will be $50 billion in just in five years. And uh, Bloomberg predicts it will be $500 billion by 2050. Do you have customers? 
Yes, uh, we have customers. The biggest customer so far is Microsoft. They do batteries for Surface Books, Surface Books Pro, and HoloLens devices. So how are they using the product? Um, yeah, so this that? is quite interesting because Microsoft is the biggest software company in the world and they still don't have software that we provide. And uh, they use this software to actually uh, help to predict performance. They have reliability team who actually test these batteries. They collect telemetry from the hardware. They understand uh, how battery perform under stress. Or if you just charge your laptop, if you charge it all day, all months, it's actually a big problem because battery is swelling and you cannot do it uh, without good testing. So you have to test all these conditions with different temperature, different uh, environment uh, vibration, any, any stress test should be done. And uh, big companies have a lot of standards that they need to follow because IE standards have quite a bit of stuff they need to check for each battery. Describe to me how you determine pricing and then also walk me through a sales cycle. Like how do you target the customer and what, how do you approach them? Right now we have uh, uh, research on the, each customer. We understand flow that they have for pr production because each cu customer is unique. They have different chemistry inside battery, different uh, technologies they use. And we try to adjust our cloud platform for the needs of the each customer. Usually we start our subscription, it's a subscription service uh, for one year about $25,000 and it can go higher, $100,000 and uh, bigger, bigger customers can pay even more. It depends on the scale of the customer, how many devices they have for battery testing, how much telemetry they produce and things like that. How much is your technology plug and play with a new type of battery versus the amount of customization you need to do for each battery type? Right now, we're trying to focus on the hardware manufacturers and these hardware manufacturers who actually build devices for battery testing. And we integrate with the top uh, two uh, American uh, hardware uh, testers and top two in China. 60% of the batteries actually produced in China. So we're also targeting this market and we're trying to uh, make sure that we can get data from these devices, parse it, analyze it in unified form. So when people actually see our tools in visualizations, they don't care which device they use for testing. It's all unified data in one place. They can search, group, analyze, and filter this data. They can go and drill down on each specific cycle of each battery, and they can compare performances between them. And what's stopping a manufacturer doing it by themselves? These manufacturers, they have uh, almost all of them, they have big expertise in the hardware, but they are not really good with machine learning and uh, software. These uh, tools that people actually use, they export to Excel, and people struggle with Excel. They spend tons of time on like building these uh, Excel spreadsheets, and if you have thousands of batteries, like if you are Samsung or Microsoft, there is no way you can do it in uh, Excel or any tools like MATLAB. So we actually automate all this process of data collection, data transformation, and data load into our system. So it's all in the cloud. We can scale quite a bit. We can spin out new machines anytime, and we can support any size of the customer. So are you a software company or a data company? We are machine learning data analytics company, and we want to focus only on uh, data because this is our biggest asset so far. We want to build on top of this data. We want to support any chemistry, any any energy storage device in future. So if you want to support uh, grid, for example, if uh, big, bigger like companies want to balance the grid, they still need battery at nighttime. So we can support data from these uh, big grid batteries and we can actually analyze it and help them to improve this performance. Some of these batteries were deployed and lifetime of the batteries 10 years, but they actually tested these batteries only for one year max. So they don't know what will this battery, how it will behave in nine years from now. So did I hear that correctly, that they, these companies already get the data and could analyze it in a different way, but they unify the data collection and the analysis? Is that what you all heard? Yeah, I'm not sure about the data collection. Certainly the analysis, and then I think they're giving insights based on their AI tools. So they're trying to do some predictive analytics as well as analytics based on the existing data. And I think they're planning on unifying that into a platform where they can, you know, make recommendations about what, you know, storage to use for this, this uh, application or that application. I have a lot of energy experience as well as being an investor in AI. So this was, you know, something that I feel like I get. He's correct that this whole battery storage issue, you know, is huge, and particularly in the electricity sector. So I think it is a sensible place for him to be, and I think the issue on the 
testing hardware is that if you're a, a company that is building you know batteries you want to be agnostic as to who's mm -hmm. testing hardware you're using so that it does make sense to have you know, one uniform platform that can take all the data regardless of what testing apparatus you're using i'm still not sure that there isn't another analytics product that can do this as well. I mean, what is so special about battery data that you can't you know, run it through a different software system with its own algorithms? Because really the problem in AI is not the algorithm, it's always do you have the data, right? So do they have any kind of way to create lock-in on the data here? I love the focus. So, you know, I, I always love when I hear an entrepreneur say, you know, this isn't the customer, this is the problem we're trying to solve. And he is lasered in on one of the biggest opportunities around re reusable energy, I yeah. think. I would love to have seen him talk a little bit more about the use of competitive comparison data, because I think if you aggregate across all of these manufacturers, but you can give insight into how is your battery actually performing versus competitors and what improvements could you make, I'm sure that will be something that will evolve for them. But I was struck by the clarity of focus and the problem they're going after. In terms of competitive differentiation, I agree with you. I don't think that was clear, clear enough. But I love the focus on a particular business and customer set. Hi, I'm Ed Wingate with Mosaic AI. Welcome to Smith Tower. If you work for a living, you need Mosaic AI to be your career agent. It'll use its machine learning and artificial intelligence abilities to compare your resume to jobs to help you understand what keywords and concepts are missing that you need in your resume to get past the HR screening software. What's also great is it'll help you prepare for conversations like the big one, the job interview. You'll have confidence by knowing what your strengths are and what topics may be discussed. And in addition to comparing your resume to jobs you find, you, employers also post jobs which you can compare your resume to and also be matched for skill and culture. Mosaic AI is available on browsers, smartphones, and chatbots. For example, just say, hey Google, find me a job in Seattle. What do I have to do as a customer to match with a Mosaic? Part of the business model is for companies to post jobs if that's what you're asking is for the companies. And that's pretty simple. The old saying is that build it, they will come. HR is desperate nowadays to find a new way to find good talent. So that's uh, not, we have not found that to be a problem is, is attracting companies. Um, the hard part, it's not really that difficult, but the challenge, the work involved, is building a big enough community that makes it you know, viable and people can find, their good, find good people. So that's what we're focusing on, is that, is making tools uh, a community, uh, uh, resources that is really AI driven and helps anticipate or predict what you'll be looking for so you can feel confident no matter where you are, uh, at work, using a browser, on your phone, in the car, uh, sorry, on the bus, I should say, or uh, you just want to talk in your home, hey, uh, uh, Mosaic AI, do I have any new jobs that are a match for me today? Or what has people been talking about, about, about me? How do I look to other people? What should be in my resume? What's new? What's happening? You can have conversations. Also, some cars also have Alexa and Google built in, so that'll be the future. So you mentioned that it's not hard to, to get businesses to buy in. What type of traction do you have so far? Well, we have a couple hundred clients who are using some of our uh, enterprise tools, mosaic.mosaictrack.com. Uh, we're having people who are posting jobs, but we're really keeping it limited, more of a beta right now, because we just launched Mosaic AI just, well, the chatbot last week, and uh, the, the application left beta about three, four months ago. So we're just kind of trying to be careful and, and go slow. And so that hasn't been a problem. So is the, is the product that, the, you know, sort of chat-based or, or uh, mobile-based, browser-based, quick check-in on, like, hey, is there a job for me kind of a thing, just making the barriers to job search really low? Or is the product more of a B2B product where you're saying we have the AI to really be able to intelligently match jobs with people and because it that seems to me and it is i'll get criticized by my colleagues here for trying to morph somebody's business but to me it seems like the trying to aggregate all of the job seekers in the world is a job that other people have already done mm -hmm. um and and so being able to say to those folks hey here is something that will now automate 
the matching of those things um, in a better way would, would make a lot more sense. Plus, you have the cold start problem of until you have a ton of data and a ton of closed loop feedback on whether the match worked, you don't really have a great AI system. So can you talk me through sort of your sure. approach uh, we there? We actually started out with mosaictrack.com, which is exactly what you described. It's a business application that, that sorts through all the applicants and all the resumes companies get. And we actually are profitable and have companies from universities to uh, recruiting firms that use this for scientific placements on college students. And it's very useful because, uh, well, the numbers. A lot of people looking for work. Uh, recruiters are about 5 to 10% effective in actually getting an interview request. We found out we're 80% effective. So when people use our tools and submit it to the hiring teams, they, they get interview requests. So obviously retention, all those metrics are very valuable. So we started Mosaic AI because a lot of people we found out, and it's common, commonly known, that uh, their resumes aren't that great. And they need help um, and, and confidence uh, in the job search. So we started that route, and yeah, I agree, it is a challenge, but so far we're doing very well. So we're happy about is that. Is the focus on the matching, or is the focus on uh, providing training, guidance, insight into how to make my resume better? Mainly the matching, because we find that people just really enjoy just being uh, shown why they're a good match and helping them prepare and then apply. We, even in the chat, they'll say, okay, this sounds great, apply to the job, apply to the job. And companies, to your point, uh, is that they would like to have a qualified applicant because a lot of applicants are just really not qualified. So we help pre-qualify that. So maybe less people applying, but much better candidates. What's been the pivot? Like, has there been something, uh, something that you've really been challenged with and had to overcome? It hasn't really been a pivot. It's just that we found, uh, well, nothing really wrong. It's just we found new opportunities. Uh, it's, for us as a small startup, I'll just be honest, it's a difficult sales cycle for corporations. They need to be convinced there's a fear of, of losing their jobs. That is always a problem. But we found that with Mosaic AI, there is really no fear. People are happy with posting a job. They're used to that. That's common. They'll do that. And they want better candidates, so it's no, um, no issues. And consumers, they love being able to have an advocate on their side, which currently doesn't really exist much. So you referenced already having a successful product out there that you mentioned was profitable. What's preventing you from scaling that product? We just like to help, help people, and we find that we work well together because it's sort of like a, a dead end. People like, they like the scaling, the, our Mosaic Track product, but then they're like, well, where do we go from here? And like you mentioned, there's already um, like LinkedIn and different aggregates out there, but they keep it very closed. You don't have access to that. So we figure, well, hey, a lot of companies are asking us, hey, can you help our career board? We'd like to have a chatbot on our career board. We would like to have all these different tools on our chat, on our career board to help people apply to our company. So we're like, well, we have the technology, why not just repurpose it for, for, for people now too? So yeah, so we figured that that's just, and maybe we're being too much geeks. Maybe we should spend more time marketing. Uh, <laughs> but we found that, that it's often good to do sort of what Google does and other companies do, is provide tools people want and use because that way uh, it's, they, they feel more comfortable. We provide a, a nice environment for people so that we don't have to like advertise to them, but they feel like they just naturally want to come in, have a seat and use our tools. Like you come into a cafe that you like instead of making them buy your, your, your something. Tough space. They have traction, but I feel the desperate need for a marketer. I was concerned about the lack of interest in selling. They're very much product focused and it sounds yeah. like they have some good ideas there, but you got to sell something. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We see a lot of uh, pitches in this space, you know, how to either make hiring decisions better, make increase retention, train managers to, you know, be better so that they can increase retention and hire better. There's a million folks going into HR and trying to sell right now, and I think that this, uh, that that's probably what he's experiencing. It is a very long sales cycle. It's, I don't think it's fear of losing jobs. It's just that you can't keep buying more and more product right. if you're in that sector. This idea of going to the consumer, again, screams for a marketer right. because, you know, how are you going to get all those folks? Or it's expensive to build a yeah. brand, to build awareness, to build that trust. Well, and, and you don't have any, I mean, maybe they've got some, some models and data they can port over from their existing enterprise business, but to really have something that works on an AI level with consumers, you've got to have a ton of data. So they have very much the cold start problem with their consumer database. Well done, you guys. Uh, Alexa, first and foremost, I, I love finding entrepreneurs that have a professional pursuit that's born out of a personal passion. Thank you for your story around uh, um, uh, magic. From my own experience with having horse riders in my family that I know just the appeal 
of the product and the service that you guys are building. So congratulations on all the success to date and Thank keep you. it up. Slava, I think we were really all struck by the size of your potential market. You did a really good job of presenting what the opportunity is and how you're going after that. So nice work. Thanks. Mosaic uh, was a super compelling story to us in terms of your product chops. What we would love to see is more on the just go to market and marketing focus and you know just pick one of those lanes and just drive it. Because as you know, this is such a big space, such a competitive space, and, and you clearly can turn out product like there's no tomorrow. So really deciding you know, how you're gonna drive that, adding more marketing muscle to the team is something that we would love to see, and uh, best of luck. Thanks. You all did a really good job, um, and we're excited to see where you all go, but the winner is Innersoft. Congratulations. They asked all insightful questions and they asked about growth and plans for the future. I think uh, it will be tremendous help from them, like uh, advisors or you know people who can guide startups to the right direction for growth. And I would like to say a big thank you to all our partners and advisors. All you guys helped us tremendously to get to this point. Thank you so much. That's a wrap for season one of the GeekWire Elevator Pitch. Follow us on geekwire.com or on Twitter at GeekWire to see who wins the final round. Judge live at the GeekWire Summit on October 2nd and 3rd.